Hello and welcome. I'm Brent Glass, Interim Executive Director of the National Building Museum. The museum's mission is unique, to serve as the country's only cultural institution dedicated to the built environment, the places where we live, work, and play. For four decades, we've presented celebrated exhibitions and programs that have explored a wide variety of topics, including design and construction, advances in sustainability and resilience, and social justice issues. Our award-winning team programs have engaged and empowered younger generations with the knowledge and tools to advance, to advocate for a better built world. And our prestigious public programs have allowed people to engage with world-renowned designers, industry leaders, educators, and scholars through a variety of formats. As you may know, our magnificent home, the historic pension building in Washington, DC, and our great hall have been closed for the past 16 months. But we're delighted to announce that we reopened on April 9th with a brand new visitor center, new exhibitions, and some old favorite exhibitions. At this time, we're open on Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays, 11 a.m. to, 11 to 4 p.m. And we hope to expand our hours as the city and the country open up. Tonight's program is very special. It marks the return of an annual series made possible through the Darwinna L. Neal Cultural Landscape Fund. Thanks to the support from this fund, which focuses on the significance of national and international cultural landscapes, the museum is deeply grateful to our friend and supporter, Darwinna Neal for making this important public program possible. We're pleased that we are finally able to offer tonight's program, The Landscapes of Frank Lloyd Wright, that was postponed last year because of the pandemic. Welcome to audiences from all over the world and those of you joining from Canada, France, and Germany. If you enjoy tonight's program, please consider supporting the museum with a gift. If you're not already a member, consider joining our membership program. You will get early access and discounts to other museum programs and events and at our outstanding museum shop, the best museum shop in DC. If you're already a member, thank you for your support. It directly impacts our ability to create world-class programs and exhibitions. Visit our website, nbm.org for more details. Now it is my pleasure to welcome our moderator, Stephen Morris. He is the chief of the office of International Affairs and World Heritage Program Co Coordinator at the National Park Service, Stephen Morris. Thank you, Brent, and <clears throat> thanks to everyone for participating this evening. I think we're gonna have an excellent series of presentations. I wanna begin by thanking uh, Darwina Neal, uh, who, as Brent mentioned, is sponsoring this panel presentation as part of an ongoing series of landscape architecture lectures at the Building Museum. Darwina began the series in 2017 to highlight the contributions of historic landscapes to the built environment, which she felt should be featured in programs of the museum. These talks have typically been timed to coincide with the International Day of Monuments and Sites, also known as World Heritage Day, April 18th, which of course was yesterday, a Sunday, so we're doing this panel today. Since my office at the National Park Service administers the World Heritage program, Darwina asked me a couple of years ago if I would moderate a session on one of the US World Heritage sites. And that year we featured Monticello in the University of Virginia. Um, I guess Darwina thought it went pretty well. She asked me again. Um, but for the pandemic, this panel originally was scheduled for last year. We would have done it in person at the museum on World Heritage Day which would have been just a few months after the 2019 World Heritage listing of a nomination known as the 20th Century Architecture of Frank Lloyd Wright. The nomination includes eight Frank Lloyd Wright buildings in six states. Its inscription as a World Heritage Site was the culmination of more than 10 years of effort. <clears throat> the Wright nomination was added to the list on the basis of Criterion 2, as the buildings collectively, uh, and here I quote, demonstrate an important interchange in the discourse that changed architecture on a global scale during the first half of the 20th century. To quote from the summary in the official statement of outstanding universal value, 
All the buildings reflect the, the organic architecture developed by Wright, which includes an open plan, a blurring of the boundaries between exterior and interior, and the unprecedented use of materials such as steel and concrete. Each of these buildings offers innovative solutions to the needs for housing, worship, work, or leisure. Wright's work from this period has had a strong impact on the development of modern architecture in Europe. The nomination stresses Wright's work as a designer of buildings, not landscapes, but nonetheless, it's impossible to talk about Wright's contributions without considering how nature influenced him, and in particular, the landscape settings of his buildings. It has been said about Wright that he took inspiration from nature's forms, but more importantly, from nature's processes. He responded to the landscape of the site where a building would be constructed. His works create a connection between building and landscape, between interior and exterior, borrowing the landscape through framed vistas. Structural elements such as deep overhanging eaves, finials, and the continuous use of materials serve to draw the eye outdoors and often to the horizon. Even in urban settings with constrained landscapes, right used light screens, stained glass abstractions of nature to create a sense of the natural landscape. Though architecture enthusiasts like to look at Wright's building, he wasn't creating objects to be stared at. Rather, his buildings were designed to enrich the lives of their inhabitants by creating spaces to see from. To quote Wright, study nature, love nature, stay close to nature, it will never fail you. And that seems a pretty apt sentiment, both for World Heritage Day, but also for Earth Day coming up this Thursday. So now turning to our panel, we have four speakers this evening and I'll introduce them all now in the order in which they'll take the floor. And we'll save questions till the end after all of the presentations are done. Please remember to put your questions in the Q&A. Um, so we'll begin with Jennifer Gray. She is the Curator of Drawings and Archives at the Avery Architectural and Fine Arts Library at Columbia University. Jennifer will be giving us a general overview. <clears throat> following her is Justin Gunther, Director, Falling Water and Vice President of the Western Pennsylvania Conservancy. He'll be speaking about Falling Water. Stuart Graff is the President and CEO of the Frank Lloyd Wright Foundation, and he'll be speaking about Taliesin. And Mark Bayer is um, the founder and principal of Bayer Landscape Architecture, and he'll be discussing the Martin House. And then we'll have questions. So with that, I'll turn it over to Jennifer. Hi, thank you um, to the National Building Museum and to Darina Neal in particular for asking me to participate in this, at this point, long awaited for event um, that was supposed to happen last April. So I'm gonna be giving a basic overview. I'm the one panelist not coming from a particular public site. I'm coming from uh, drawings and archives at Avery Library at Columbia University. So I've tried to show some archival documents that we use to do uh, this kind of research since I'm not talking about a particular landscape. And so I'm going to just give kind of an overview of different sort of themes and projects that I've worked on over the past five or six years um, in my research on Franklin Wright and landscape and set the stage for a more in detail, in depth talk by my my colleagues here. And I thought I would open by showing a video clip. Um, there are 270 some odd films that came with the Franklin Wright archive when it was transferred to Avery and to the Museum of Modern Art. And they were recently digitized. So I thought it'd be a fun uh, way for me to open this um, uh, this presentation. It, it's, a, it's a two minute clip, but it looks at two of the landscapes that were so critical for Franklin Wright. The first is Wisconsin, where Taliesin is now located. And the second is Taliesin West, uh, the Sonoran Desert. There's no sound, so don't be alarmed if you just see videos. And I'll kind of just lay some groundwork um, on top of this video while you're watching it. Um, so it opens with Taliesin uh, in Wisconsin, the rolling hills and farmlands of Spring Green. Um, and of, the, of course, this was a kind of family uh, ancestral area as well. Um, they had farms and a school was built on the land and things like that. So this had a, a very formative impact on Franklin Wright well before Taliesin was built. Um, and the Hillside Homeschool, I should mention, was also built in this location, which I'll talk about towards the end of my talk. Um, about halfway through, it'll switch over to Taliesin West and the Sonoran Desert and his encounters uh, with a very very different kind of landscape also informed Wright's practices. So these are kind of two poles we can think about in terms of uh, the environment and how they might impact Wright's architecture. And I thought how I would organize my talk today is just sort of some broad themes or broad strokes that I've noticed in my various research projects um, on this topic keep kind of coming up and recurring. Um, they're different, but they do overlap. And so I'll kind of introduce them here and then I'll go into some details. 
uh, about them showing other other slides from the archive. Um, one is obviously nature and landscape impact of Franklin Wright's architecture. Um, and I'll talk about a few different ways that that, uh, that happened. Um, he's very sensitive to the, the site and the kind of regional plants and the environment and things like that. Um, but there's some other uh, ways where it more impacts his design process. Um, the second kind of umbrella or bucket is Wright's sort of burgeoning environmentalism. Um, he was very concerned in some cases about the actual conservation of landscapes, and he partners with many other landscape architects uh, and activists such as Jens Jensen. I'll talk a little bit more about him, but they found these sort of very early conservation type, uh, type movements uh, to try and preserve what remained of the native prairie landscapes around Chicago and around Wisconsin. Um, the third kind of uh, bucket here is Wright's activism. Um, we'll see that kind of his social politics play out in these landscapes as well. Um, he's part of a kind of very progressive milieu in Chicago that included not just architects and landscape architects, but sociologists and uh, educators, um, uh, uh, politicians and things like that. Um, so he's very uh, plugged into kind of trying to advance um, social equality and, uh, and overcome different kinds of problems uh, in the early 20th century. He plays this out on the landscape as well. And the last kind of big bucket is the role that education played in landscape and how Wright leveraged the Taliesins and the farms and things like that um, to promote a new kind of education. And again, he was not alone in doing this. Uh, he was simply uh, a part of a milieu. So to kind of back up and talk about architecture, environmentalism, politics, and education, I'm just going to start uh, at the top with architecture. Um, and so I'm showing you here, um, I brought in some more, uh, you know, kind of typical prairie style uh, images. These are all uh, high res images taken from the Frank the Wright archive. So just if you're curious and haven't had a chance to research there, just know that these are the kinds of materials that you'll encounter. Um, and in this case, what I'm showing you are applied pattern studies that one of Wright's most trusted uh, apprentices created. These are in the early 1940s. 40s, uh, Eugene Masselink. Um, and so one of the ways that Wright is influenced by nature is he, he has a general desire to have his architecture harmonize with the natural environment. And I'll show a few uh, images in that direction as well. And we tend to think of Wright as like a prairie, he leading this kind of prairie school of architecture and the horizontality uh, and kind of low rise uh, 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 architectural elements associated with that school that had an affinity with the kind of Midwestern prairies. But I think a couple of other ways uh, to think about Wright and how landscape and the environment environment and nature more broadly speaking impacted his architecture has to do with like a design process. And so what's happening here in these applied pattern studies, and I brought in just a few more, um, these green ones here, these are actually different studies of cactuses. So there's a saguaro cactus on the left-hand side um, and then a, a chola cactus on the right-hand side. But he's really interested in looking below their surfaces and trying to see what sort of design or construction principles um, exist in these natural examples. So he, 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 he has this phrase that he looks below for the abstractions and the geometric ordering uh, underneath, uh, uh, underneath nature. So this is one of the ways, and you'll see that it's not just plant light, but also just the broad landscape um, on the left hand side are these desert studies and then uh, kind of a rock study on the right hand side. So the point of these design practices was to get below the kind of natural appearances of the environment and of plants and search for design principles. Um, and another thing that he's very interested in is this notion of organic architecture. And so organic in some terms, we can think about it relating to nature and plants and things like that. But organic is also about creating a fully integrated architecture where every piece of the building and the design works together uh, as a whole. Um, so he likens again this to plants that in nature, everything uh, is organic. There's nothing uh, uh, kind of superficial or no decorations are added on. Everything has kind of a function and use in this organic whole. And the last way to think about right and nature and the impact on his architecture um, that I've been thinking about lately is his relationship to materials, like what kinds of materials he uses to build uh, uh, you know, different buildings. Um, he'll use textile block, he uses masonry rubble, which I'm sure will come up more uh, when we talk about Taliesin West, but he has a theory about the nature of materials and really need to work with the inherent qualities of the materials versus fight against them. Um, and I brought this in as just one of many examples where he does this, it's an unbuilt project uh, for a hotel called San Marcos in the Desert. And he envisioned that this hotel would be built out of uh, concrete blocks, essentially. Um, and in most cases with the concrete blocks, he, he does a, many, a series of experiments with these in the 1920s. And again, he revisits the concept after World War II with his Usonian automatic uh, concrete block system. But oftentimes with these concrete blocks, he's 
envisioning that the aggregate for making the blocks would be literally pulled from the site itself. So in those cases, the actual landscape or the site on which the building is situated um, is incorporated into the building material. So you almost get into kind of a, um, you know, we could almost like a molecular uh, type of relationship to uh, the nature of the site and just nature in general. Um, and I think I mentioned to you before his early environmentalism, um, San Marcos is another good example of this, um, you know, right even early on, he's thinking about uh, conservation movements uh, and trying to advance uh, saving some of these uh, some of these landscapes. In the case of San Marcos, um, you know, Wright was really enamored with with the desert. Um, he writes a whole article uh, in 1941, I think it is, called "On Arizona," where he's really like marveling at just the the stunning natural environment there. And towards the end of this essay, um, he really goes into details about his concern about overdevelopment, about ecotourism. You know, more and more people are coming here. This hotel, if it had been built, is you know one example of that overdevelopment uh, and ecotourism. He's concerned about all the irrigation that has to happen and just that, you know, if there's overdevelopment, we'll ruin this pristine natural landscape. And he even goes so far as to advocate that if the state of Arizona didn't protect the landscape, then the federal government should take over uh, the Sonoran Desert and protect it on behalf of the state. So that's unusual. I, I have found for Frank Wood Wright, he's often a bit skeptical of big government, but in this case, he was really uh, 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 kind of moving forward uh, with trying to think of ways to save, uh, save this environment. In the case of San Marcos, how he gets around the irrigation ditch problem, this was meant to be be, you know, not having an irrigation system, but of course you needed water. Um... Uh, for these large uh, hotels, he actually envisions it to kind of operate like a dam, if you can see my um, my cursor there. Um, the building straddles an arroyo, and so water that normally would be lost through kind of flash flooding, it's held back behind the hotel, and so he creates kind of a reservoir of sorts. There's, you know, critics argue it probably wouldn't have worked, but he's still trying to think of how to work with the natural environment. Um, a few other just examples to start moving away from to some of the more social politics. Here is another unbuilt project, uh, the Sherman Booth House. This is the first scheme, which not get built, a later scheme did get built, but you can see him working with the kind of horizontal, you know, uh, uh, design of the prairie style to work with connecting this house to its landscape. The landscape in this case, um, it's in outside of Chicago, but it's actually a very kind of rocky kind of old glacial ravines and things like that. So he was really having to be quite creative about how to um, have the house sort of harmonize with its, with its site. Um, I brought in, I mentioned before that he worked with uh, uh, different landscape architects, this kind of milieu of people that were concerned about these issues. Um, Jens Jensen was a major one of these. Walter Burley Griffin, who was one of his apprentices, um, or I guess before apprentices, he was one of his employees in the Oak Park studio. Um, but he did kind of work in a group of people that were thinking about landscape architecture and design. Uh, Jens Jensen uh, collaborated with Wright on several projects, this being one of them. And it's probably difficult to see in, you know, on Zoom on the screen here, but this is a very elaborate uh, planting plan, which I think will come back up with the Darwin Martin House. But, you know, Jensen's really getting specific about what kinds of plant species will be located uh, in these gardens. It's, you know, he's very much Jens Jensen as and so is right kind of associated with a movement towards using like regional ecologies and native plants and things like that in these new garden designs. It's called the Prairie, it's a prairie movement um, in landscape architecture that correlates uh, um, uh, with the same in architecture. And what we have found in our research is that they're, they're less orthodox about only using native or indigenous species. It's more fluid than that, actually. The idea is to have things growing at different times of the year. So that doesn't necessarily hold up under um, close scrutiny. Um, I'll just briefly talk about this for time because I want to make sure I get to education. Um, so this is a a graphic that I've looked at many times. Um, it's a graphic design that Wright created around, we're not totally sure what he worked on it over several years, sometime between 1913 and around 1921. Um, but essentially this would have been like a graphic design that would have you know, gone on the top of um, you know, newsletters and different kinds of promotional material for this conservation organization called Friends of Our Native Landscape. Um, and this was founded by Jensen in 1913. And so it's another example of how Wright is trying to think about conservation and working in these landscape kind of connections. Um, he argues one of the most interesting finds that I had in the archive was this kind of sketch for the Jensen graphic. And Wright goes to a lot of detail to explain like the various symbolisms of them. And I don't have time to go into all the details, but essentially he's offering us like an abstracted prairie, like this horizontal line um, is an abstracted prairie. Um, he makes mention of different kind of, again, social and kind of political issues. He expresses concern in these notations on the right-hand side um, about the displacement of Native Americans. He's associated with an activist named Hanlon Garland, who's mentioned on this document, um, who was an advocate for Native American rights at this time. So, you know, thinking, again, bigger picture about how landscape and um, colonization and things like this do impact like the social and kind of politics. Um, 
Oh, I'm talking too fast. I just saw in the chat. I will slow down. I'm trying to adhere to my 10 minutes. <laughs> so just to get to education, um, I brought in just the, again some 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 photographs from from the archive. Um, Wright was very interested in leveraging farming and the landscape and nature for educational purposes. And I mentioned before he was not alone in this. Um, what you're seeing here are um, examples of apprentices at Taliesin working, like doing this kind of farm work and things like that. And I just brought in like a smattering of them so you can see just some different examples. Um, but really like farming and working with the land was a key aspect of going to school at Taliesin. Um, you know, the idea was that you would learn different things about um, uh, education through these teaching gardens is what they were often called at the time. So to give you some examples, um, and it was framed in the early 20th century as a new education is what it was called. And the emphasis here was on active learning that you would learn through direct experience. So for example, farming in a garden would cause students to learn about uh, climate, right, and about the weather and about soil chemistry and things like that. So the act of actually gardening and being in these spaces was viewed to be an educational uh, uh, approach to a more direct way of learning rather than just memorizing. And this approach was called a new education at the time. Um, and the last couple of things I wanted to bring up in this regard is that Wright comes from a long, uh, you know, an esteemed kind of family background of working in this new education. So I'm just showing you some historic um, shots of the valley um, around Taliesin. Uh, his aunts in the 1880s founded a very progressive school called the Hillside Home School. And essentially what it was, was a farm, home and industrial school all combined together that was located in the Spring Valley uh, 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 land of the Lloyd-Jones family. Um, here's some prospectuses from the school just so you get a sense of what um, what they were about. It's deliberately sited outside of the outside of the city in the countryside for a variety of reasons that they go into in the prospectus and you just get a sense of how much the soil and the earth and the countryside was an important part um, of this pedagogy. And I think I have one more. There we go. Um, and nature study was integral to the curriculum. So it wasn't the only active learning. There's also book binding, metal work, you know, uh, designing, stenciling, but nature study was a key aspect of this to go out into nature and learn um, abstract concepts like chemistry and agriculture and uh, things like that, but through direct interaction uh, with nature. And my last slide to kind of bring this back, um, or second to last slide, I should say, um, they talk also about nature in terms of it being an antidote to the city, that it's uh, cleaner and it's more hygienic and things like that. Um, I think it's important to keep in mind that in the 1880s and 1900 in Chicago, it's a very volatile mix of um, uh, issues happening at this time. There were some major public health uh, problems happening, um, lack of access to good education, lack of access to you know clean milk and water and things like that. So Wright and many of these activists are trying to address these larger social and political problems. And so uh, uh, getting students outside of these conditions and into you know, a countryside school uh, was seen to be one of, one of the answers. But in the list of supporters here on the right-hand side, you can see again, just this um, uh, the breadth of different people that are uh, participating in this Jane Adams, for example, was a very important uh, uh, founder of Hull House Settlement and a social activist. So um, the idea around landscape, it starts connecting to a lot of other political and educational uh, type systems. And my last slide, I just wanted to also kind of put this into context. Um, Wright's aunts with the Hillside Homeschool were extremely progressive and ahead of their time in establishing it. Um, and perhaps better known name is John Dewey. Uh, he was a social scientist at the University of Chicago and founded an experimental school down there. But he too was part of this big push toward, to interrelate uh, the home, the farm and industry into one kind of unified way of teaching. And these are some diagrammatics that he uh, draws. This is around uh, 1900, 1899, where you can see he's clearly connecting like textile industries to the home, to the kitchen, to the garden and the park. Um, and so he's a big proponent and advocate of this type of active direct learning that would send students out into the landscape to have them experiment and do things and then come back into the school uh, to, to, uh, to learn the more abstract concepts. Um, and the last thing I'll just say is that in rights, um, just to kind of bring the landscape back to social issues, in Wright's um, 
you know, relationship with Jens Jensen, which went on for, you know, many years. And Jensen also established a school of the soil, it was called, the clearing, uh, not long after Taliesin was founded. Um, but Jensen was a, an emerging pioneer of uh, uh, ecology, actually, understanding plants to be in association with other plants around them and their environments. You can't study them in an isolated way. It's all uh, mutually kind of informing. Um, and at the time, I think it's important to think they called that plant sociology, that they would they were studying and understanding plants in communities. And so I think, you know, one another way to kind of think about right and landscape is he too at Taliesin, uh, both of them, is trying with his school, is trying to establish like a community of people living and working together in the land. And, and so the idea of plant sociology, I mean, he maybe transfers that to talk about it's almost a human ecology. And so I, I think it's important to end on this note of community and trying to use these resources to overcome some of the, the challenges that uh, Wright was certainly facing at the turn of the century and that arguably we're, we're still, still facing. All right, uh, Jen, <clears throat> really fascinating presentation. And I'll take you to the, the woods of Western Pennsylvania to introduce you to falling water and its landscape. I uh, just wanted to uh, begin by thanking the National Building Museum, uh, particularly also Darwina and Neil for the opportunity to present tonight and uh, to Stephen Morris for the introduction. Um, but Falling Water, Falling Water is Frank Lloyd Wright's tour de force. It's his masterpiece of his philosophy of organic architecture, where building, furnishings, and landscape form a singular unified composition. And it's by using a limited palette of materials, colors, and design motifs, all derived from the natural features of the site that Wright is able to create a house that's intimately tied to its forested setting. Now, F Falling Water would have never existed without Pittsburgh, the heart of American steelmaking at the Industrial Revolution, in a place that seemed to contradict everything about Wright's ideals of living in unison with the land of not dominating it with reckless abandon. And to escape the pollution of the steel city, Pittsburghers retreated to the private rustic camps that were scattered throughout the mountains east of the city in the Alleghenies. And one of those camps grew up along Bear Run, which is a rock bottom stream that drops over a thousand feet in elevation during its short four mile course. And central to that Bear Run Camp landscape is a pair of dramatic waterfalls, one over 20 feet high and the other 10 feet high. The Kaufman family were owners of Pittsburgh's largest department store, and they discovered the Bear Run Camp in the 1920s. And as socially conscious employers, they began leasing the camp as a vacation place for the store staff. The family quickly gained an affection for the landscape and by the early 1930s began thinking about their own formal vacation house there rather than the rustic cabin that they typically stayed in. So they thought of Frank Lloyd Wright as their architect. Um, and after inviting Wright to the site, um, Wright was immediately drawn to the power of the waterfalls. Um, and as we know, Wright was long fascinated with waterfalls, likely beginning with his early trips to Japan. And similar to the Shinto Shrine at the base of Ono Falls in this um, woodblock print by Hokusai that Frank Lloyd Wright owned, for the Kaufmans, Wright envisioned a house for communion with the spirituality of the falls. Um, and in this plan, we can see the design starting to take shape. Um, and rather than sighting the house on the opposite side of the stream, looking at the waterfalls, Wright nestled the house among the massive boulders um, beside the falls on a very narrow footprint. Um, and it, you can see the house kind of nestling in between an existing campground road at the top of the plan and the stream and falls uh, at the bottom of the plan. Now construction on the house began in 1936 and it took three years to complete. Most of the labor being supplied by local farmers that were trained on site. Um, they quarried all of the native Pottsville sandstone for the stone walls from the property and laid it up in patterns that mimic, mimics the natural rock outcroppings found in the landscape. And they erected this rather precarious looking scaffold to support the formwork for pouring the concrete of the, of the cantilevers, getting all of the aggregate for the concrete from the site itself. <clears throat> 
Wright would write that he composed Falling Water's design to the music of the stream, the architecture becoming a sculptural expression of the cascade. And Wright took direct inspiration from nature while at the same time abstracting its forms to create an entirely modern language that avoided imitation. The result being a house that seems to grow from the boulders of the site dramatically cantilevered over the falls. In conceiving the design, Wright took into account the primary forces of nature, those being sun and gravity. With respect to sun, Wright laid out the plan of falling water using the crest of the waterfall as his drafting baseline. Then by positioning the face of the cantilevers at 30 degrees to the edge of the falls, the house was given a perfect south-southeastern orientation providing with just the right amount of forest light. And then with respect to gravity, the house is grounded to its site by the stone towers, but then Wright saw the cantilevers as a way to assert freedom from traditional forms and in an essence defy the downward force of gravity. The two main cantilevers of falling water over the falls take direct inspiration from the rock ledges of the two waterfalls and the stacking of one on top of the other mimics the vertical stacking of the falls in the landscape. The result is a house equal and wedded to nature, one that cascades down the hillside like the rushing water of the stream. From the guest house lying comfortably into the hillside at the top, down the curve of the stepped canopy to the intersecting masses of the main house below. In fitting the architecture into the woods, Wright paid reverence to existing trees, preserving all over a certain diameter by stepping the floor plan or by bending trellis beams. The interplay of man-made and natural creates an interconnectedness that reinforces the relationship between the two. Building and nature are dependent on one another, like the cantilevered west terrace that grips onto this moss-covered rock with three fingers tightly holding on for support that it needs to float in free space. If we look inside, while the interiors are inviting, Wright always directs your attention back to the outside. Ceilings are low to create shelter while at the same time encouraging outward looking. In the vertical patterns of the casement windows, rhythmically in frame views of the landscape, making nature the house's primary artwork. And throughout the design, nature is invited inside, like the large boulder that emerges through the living room floor to become the hearth of the fireplace. And the boundary line between inside and out seems to simply dissolve, like the effect created by this round built-in planter and by the, by the floor to ceiling glass doors, which when swung open, allow inside spaces to freely flow out onto open air terraces. No more dramatically is the building's tie to nature illustrated than by the living room hatch, which allows you to descend and connect all of your senses directly to the stream. And by waxing the flagstone of the floors, Wright creates a visual continuity between the reflective surface of the stream below and the glistening ripples of the wax stone inside the house. For the color palette of the house, both inside and out, Wright only used his signature red on the steel window frames and an ochre on the reinforced concrete. For the concrete, like Wright looked directly to the landscape, to the rhododendron, which is this forest predominant understory plant. And if you look closely in the foreground, you can see that some of the rhododendron leaves have shifted from their vibrant green to a yellowish brown. And it's the color of these dying rhododendron leaves that inspired Wright's color for the house. Falling Water remained the Kaufman's private retreat for almost 30 years. And in 1964, Falling Water opened to the public as a museum. From the beginning of public operations, a focus of our interpretation has been how the visitor experiences this landscape. And that experience is a very orchestrated one, a progression through the site. Um, and I'm gonna walk you through um, what we distinguish as four separate zones for interpretation and management um, by, by using this site plan. And just to quickly orient you, um, Falling Water is located on the plan just below the North Arrow. And then the other large brown footprint on the plan is the visitor center with its corresponding parking lot below it. And before I get into the, the zones of management, I also want to 
uh, point out, it's important to realize that while the falling water landscape is managed, um, it's very much a living landscape, one that's constantly evolving and one that is allowed to change throughout forest succession. So as visitors arrive through the main gate, they're first welcomed by the presentation forest, which gives visitors a sense of the structure and diversity of the surrounding forest while providing a somewhat enhanced forest aesthetic, like the manicured moss floor along the entry road to the largely open air visitor center, which while covered immerses the visitor into the forest, further orienting them into the landscape that will largely shape their experience. Then after leaving the visitor center, guests enter into the cultural setting, which preserves the formal context of the Kaufman's use of the site as a self-sufficient country estate. Here, visitors encounter a cut lawn, a small cottage once used by the live-in gardener and cutting beds planted with flowers for use in the house, as well as a romantic aging apple orchard alongside the raked gravel driveway leading to the house. As visitors walk the drive, they begin to hear the rushing water of Bear Run off in the distance. Since the sounds of the stream are ever present in the experience of the architecture, in a way visitors will hear the house before they see it. And once they round the bend in the drive and catch their first glimpse of the house, they've entered into what we call the forest garden. This landscape directly around the house is the most managed with pruning and transplanting to control vistas and enhanced views with the addition of native wildflowers, ephemerals, ferns, and grasses to heighten the romance. And in very controlled ways, exotics that were introduced by the Kaufmans are maintained, like the wisteria on the guest house trellis, or this japonica that defines the bend in the drive at the eastern end of the house. And even at Falling Water, a house immersed in an essentially undesigned landscape Wright employs outdoor planters to extend the structure out into nature and further highlight nature as ornament. And finally, the last zone creating the backdrop for the entire experience is the surrounding deciduous forest, which is managed with a conservation approach focusing mainly on management of inv invasive species. And if we zoom out and up above falling water, which you can just make out at the bottom right of this image, you get a sense of the forest backdrop surrounding and protecting falling water, which expands to a 5,100 acre nature reserve. And the reserve is home not just to deciduous forest, but to post agricultural fields and over a dozen vernacular structures maintained by falling water, including a 19th century dairy barn owned by the Kaufmans uh, and now used as event and office space, and a delightful one room chapel alongside the highway that welcomes visitors traveling from the South into our cultural landscape. And just to close, I'll return to the iconic view of falling water. Um, and because of its rural location and because of, because of the house's purpose as a mountain retreat, Wright created no formal plan for the landscape because it was simply unnecessary. The beauty and drama of the site required no improvement except by the architecture itself. For Wright, a building was meant to rest easy with the earth and bear an intimate relation to nature. Architecture was meant to bring a new order into the landscape and a new clarity to every vista. And at Falling Water, that certainly rings true. It's a place where nature and architecture are both made happier because of the other. Thanks. I'm Stuart Graff, and I'm going to take you through the landscape at Taliesin. Um, in the World Heritage dossier that Steve referred to, Taliesin is described as the consummate example of organic connection to the landscape. And I think the reason that it has that, um, that, that bearing is because this is the place where Wright was doing so much of his work, so much of his experimentation from a very early point in, uh, in his work. Sorry, I'm just trying to find where the chat has gone. So, um, sorry, I'm not able to grab the chat, there it is. Um, okay. Um, so let's, uh, let, let's take an overview of the area where Taliesin sits. Um, what we're looking at on screen is an image from space of the Lloyd Jones Valley. This is the valley that Jennifer referred to where Wright's ancestors settled in, the, in uh, southwestern Wisconsin in the middle of the 19th century. It is often called the Driftless Region 
because it is unglaciated. Uh, the area just to the east and to the north is heavily glaciated, but this terrain is marked by steep hills, by deep river valleys, and you see that in, uh, in the image. Um, it is also dominated by the Wisconsin River, which flows from east to west, and as you can see in this picture, takes a little bit of a horseshoe bend south and then back north, just above Taliesin. And Taliesin is the area just, let's see if we can get to show this. It's where my cursor is showing. So it's this area just below the bend in the river. Um, I don't think it's an accident that Wright cited the, uh, the, uh, his property there, not only because of its historic connection with his family, but also because of the features that we see on the landscape. So the Wisconsin River is, uh, as you see here, um, features these wonderful limestone outcroppings. This corresponds to what Justin was referring to in terms of the sandstone found along Bear Run. All through this valley, you have these limestone outcroppings. And in this region that Wright grew up in, this landscape that really uh, became the school for him to understand nature and how nature could be incorporated into structure, um, you, see, uh, you see these blocky, chalky areas just emerge suddenly from the landscape. Wright uses this in his own work. And at a point on our property that you're seeing here, he actually quarries stone. So what we're looking at is the quarry on the landscape just above the river where the stone from Taliesin is taken. Uh, and it's taken by Wright, by, uh, by his associates at the time, as well as work from the area. If we turn the camera the other way, we can see Phoebe Point and how it sits above the river. Uh, the river is slow moving here, um, but there is a good current and it's today used for recreation. As our land at Taliesin borders the, um, borders the river, we are now in the process of forest management and clearing much of this land so that it can be used for recreational purposes in a way that's responsible to the environment. So it will still be a forest. I misspoke when I said clearing, uh, but clearing away the understory, the, the brush and the invasive species found in the land. So it can be enjoyed in its natural states um, as a, a wonderful recreation area. Let's move in a little bit closer to Taliesin. So this is a recent satellite photograph. And here we can, we can start to see the terrain around Taliesin. We have here the main house, which sits in this little roadway circle that I'm highlighting. We have the Midway Barn, which we'll be looking at next to a second hill. We have the Hillside School, um, which was also a studio that sits um, on, on a fairly uh, uh, low area on the property. And then just above that on another hill, we have, uh, we have what's called Tanny Dairy, and we'll take a, a quick look at that. To the east, we have uh, the Welsh Hills as they're known, a uh, beautiful, uh, beautiful forested hillside that we are using um, today for trails, uh, for people to go out and enjoy nature. To the north, again, the riverfront, which is dominated again by forest and these, uh, these uh, buttes above the, uh, above the river, and more hills going out to the west of the property. This is the view of the Welsh Hills from the ground overlooking part of the farm at Taliesin. And you can see what these, this landscape looks like. The forested hills, but also these wonderful prairies coming down from the hill and traversing the valley, some of which have now been cleared for agricultural purposes. Taliesin is also uh, dominated by a water feature. Uh, the land of Taliesin and that, uh, that point that, uh, that we were looking at over the river, known as Phoebe Point, is the place where Lowry Creek, uh, uh, one of the tributaries into the Wisconsin, uh, joins the Wisconsin River. What we see on the photograph on the left is a current satellite photograph, which shows Lowry Creek running through the property. That's this channel that's coming along the property. And what you're seeing is, is how it sits along what is now the bottom of the pond that's been exposed as we're working on the Taliesin Dam, uh, making some repairs and doing some restoration work. On the right-hand side, you can see what that looks like when the pond is filled, and that pond was created by Wright as a landscape feature. Unfortunately, as you can see in the photograph, the pond is being affected by agricultural runoff 
uh, from farms upstream in the community, not so much agricultural runoff at Taliesin itself where the farming is organic. And so we were working with the watershed uh, management district and other farmers and property owners along Lowry Creek to try to remediate that problem. And here's an image of the dam itself. Um, this is what it looked like just before we began the work. And notice on the left-hand side that you see how Wright is using stone, quarried stone uh, from that hilltop butte that we, uh, we were looking at a few moments ago and starting to incorporate it into the landscape so that the dam seems to be tied in to a natural rock formation that one might find all through this valley. Here's what it looks like when the landscape is a little bit more lush. And unfortunately today, the landscape looks like this until we, uh, we are able to, um, to complete the work on the dam sometime this spring and begin to refill the pond. I think it's interesting. This has been going on for two years and you can see just how quickly nature has reclaimed the, the, the course of Lowry Creek and how it's already dug a fairly deep channel um, as it makes its way back to the Wisconsin River. In summer, again, another view of the ponds. Here we're looking over something called the bird walk from uh, the house of Taliesin. Um, this is through a, a window um, and uh, it's taken at roughly the same time of year as the previous slide. So um, you can just see what impact that design water feature has on the views from the house of Taliesin. Another view of the Welsh Hills this uh, couple of autumns ago, um, the, the relationship of the hills and the water to the house become an integral part of Wright's design. And here we see a second feature of this landscape, the prairie. Uh, one of the things that the foundation has been working on very closely with uh, other organizations in the area is prairie landscape management. We conduct controlled burns um, every year as weather permits um, to ensure that we're restoring nutrients to the soil, uh, removing invasive species and allowing the prairie to function as a natural ecosystem. Jen referred to plant sociology in her talk. And one of the things that we care greatly about is restoring ecosystems and maintaining ecosystems because Wright's work really is in effect an ecosystem among the built environment, nature and human activity. Another view of the prairie. And now we begin to glimpse the house on the right hand side of the photograph, rising on the hillside over the prairie and facing toward the Welsh Hills. Another view of the house, you see uh, how quickly the landscape uh, descends down from the, uh, uh, the house, both uh, directly in front of us and then off to the right. Um, the hill is fairly steep and the, the um, house isn't sitting on the top of the hill, but rather surrounds the crown of the hillside itself. But notice as at falling water, the way that the house is starting to emerge directly from the landscape. You see these concrete, I'm sorry, these, uh, these limestone uh, piers uh, intersecting with concrete terraces, some cantilevers again, uh, in order to create this relationship between the, uh, the structure and the inherent features of the land. Now we're looking out uh, through the Port Cochere uh, toward the main, uh, toward the Welsh Hills and off to our right is the main entry to Taliesin. So notice again, the use of rusticated stone um, quarried from the site, both to create the walls of the buildings, but also um, to give you a, 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 a place to walk that isn't formal, isn't, um, isn't polished, and doesn't necessarily appear as if it is inherently man-made. It seems to emerge much like the stone itself from the underlying soil, with the exception of the sharp edges of the, uh, of the stairs themselves. As you come around that bend and ascend the stairs, you immediately notice a few different things. You start to see these pools again in rusticated stone and notice the uneven um, placement of the stones, that they are not set in specific courses like brickwork, nor are they set to provide a smooth front. Rather, they appear just as those buttes appear. So he is working to give you that sense of being a part of nature. And here you see how the hill crown actually rises from the center of the, uh, the complex uh, that is the house, the studio and surrounding farm buildings. 
we start to see as we turn the corner, and I'm going through different seasons here, so that's why we see different light and different plants. But here we start to see the gardens, uh, which are a mixture of native species, but also exotics, as uh, as Jen has pointed out, right, was not uh, was not focused only on native uh, native species. You see a lot of Asian species at work here, lilies and other plants, um, and that I think reflects Wright's interest in the Asian landscape derived from his study of Japanese woodblock prints and other Asian art. But you also see more stones ascending toward a tea circle off on the right underneath some oak trees and then ascending to the, uh, the hill crown itself. Taliesin means shining brow, and many people believe that he uses that term not only to reflect his Welsh heritage, but also because of his belief that the crown of the hill is for nature, and that uh, at most we should build at the brow of the hill respecting nature. This also allows him then to incorporate the shape of the hill in the design of the, uh, uh, of the landscape and of the property. When we ascend to the hill crown, we start to overlook the farm, and we're sitting on about 800 acres, mixture of forest, um, the ponds, of course, and farmland. So we look over a planted garden, and when we get to the hill crown, we get our first glimpse of the farm itself. But notice also the use of rusticated stone walls and outcroppings that will appear in the landscape. Another view at a different season, we're looking at, at flocks up, uh, up in the front here. The fields may be planted with corn, may be planted with soybeans, any number of plants. And the farm has been organically farmed since 1932. And we maintain an organic farm on the property today in partnership with a wonderful tenant farmer. As we descend back uh, from the hill crown, we walk toward the entrance of the house. And this just gives you another view of the cultivated gardens uh, found in the central courtyard at Taliesin. But when we enter the house and we come into the loggia, we enter a space that has beautiful furniture off on the right, and I'm afraid it's a little bit dark there. We have a magnificent Asian screen, one of many pieces of Asian art that's found in the property. But what you're really seeing more than anything else is the landscape. Wright borrows the landscape, a technique that's used in Asian art, but he uses it here in architecture to incorporate the landscape as an architectural feature of the site. Uh, and he does this in every room. Here's the living room at Taliesin, which blurs this relationship between the interior and exterior, particularly through the use of features like this low ceiling, um, which forces your eye out into the landscape rather than upward. Um, that low ceiling that you see on the right also extends out as an eave overhanging the property. Here we're in Wright's bedroom. Um, we see a view out toward those pools and toward a pergola. And here we have the studio. Uh, and I keep thinking that that view through the windows of the studio looks very much like a Japanese or uh, Chinese landscape. Um, if we spin around, we see how we can view the pergola. Um, a steel construction, but one that has ornamental forms resembling, uh, resembling nature. We'll also look quickly at the barn, um, which we see integrated into the hillside. Uh, the hill is actually on the right, and the barn emerges directly from the hill. We're about to start a restoration project on this barn um, so that it can be used uh, in any number of programs, not only our farming, but also our education programs. And when we come to the, the south of the property, we can really view the entirety of the landscape in a panoramic photo. Here we have Tanny Dairy and the, wind, uh, the windmill known as Romeo and Juliet. This was originally built as, uh, as a house for his sister and is one of the older structures on the property. But again, you see how it relates to the hill and to the landscape. Tanny Dairy, by the way, is a Welsh term meaning under the oaks. And I want to leave you with this view. Um, as I said, Wright is designing a landscape um, uh, in a way that is intended to impact our lives. In fact, it's the foundation's belief that Wright's organic yeah. architecture is really about creating an architecture for better living with nature, with art, and with each other. And now I'll turn it over to Mark. Thank you very much. My name is Mark Bayer. I'm um principal of Bayer Landscape Architecture in the Rochester, New York area. Thrilled to be here tonight to talk about uh, 
the Martin House Landscape. It's a project we were have been involved with uh, in the rehabilitation process of the landscape. We were involved for over six years from 2014 to 2020, and we remain involved uh, you know, post-implementation. Our work followed uh, over a 10-year building restoration reconstruction process led by HHL Architects of Buffalo. The both projects, just a fantastic and challenging process and our work has brought back together once again, what we think Wright's most significant residential commissions. Um, unlike Falling Water and Taliesin, uh, the Martin House project really took place in a residential subdivision neighborhood, a, a beautiful area uh, originally conceived by uh, the Olmsted firm back about uh, 1870s, it really didn't get going till the early 1900s in a significant way, but it was conceived as part of the Delaware Park, the Buffalo Park system as um, a periphery project that would kind of insulate the park um, and protect the park. Uh, but what Wright was dealing with was not a spectacular natural landscape, not a uh, a site with amazing special natural features. This was a, again, a residential lot, actually a couple lots that the Martin family purchased in the early 1900s, totaling about 1.3 acres and basically a blank slate. And what was left be, you know, beyond the, the flat site was uh, an intersection of Jewett and Summit. Um, and this is what Wright began with. And so, Unlike the previous two projects, this was a landscape that really had to be created. And uh, it was created by Mr. Wright. And one of his associates worked right alongside with him, Walter Burley Griffin, Jennifer had mentioned him. He was an employee of Wright at this time. And one of the fascinating things to me about this project, uh, again, looking at it for the first time with some of these sketches. Uh, when I looked at this sketch, this early sketch of the, the Martin House complex of buildings, immediately I saw as a landscape architect, I see Wright's thinking going on here of shaping space with his building forms in the very earliest, earliest sketch. He is shaping outdoor space and creating the beginnings of indoor outdoor relationships and landscape related to building and building related to landscape. It becomes even more evident in this early uh, version of the first floor plans. You can see again more clearly uh, how these building forms are, he's thinking spatially outside as well as inside. Um, in the uh, upper uh, left corner, the Martin House proper, there's the long pergola structure that connects across the center of the screen. And then there is a conservatory on the far upper right and a uh, carriage house barn uh, attached to that. And then lower right is the Barton House, which was built, uh, designed and built uh, for Darwin Martin's sister, Delta. Uh, but landscape is already in play in this early design. You can see the scribblings of plant massings and thinking going on early in the process. This just gives you a, more of a figure ground study showing you again how these building massings work and quickly again the Martin House upper left, long pergola connecting to what would become the conservatory and above the conservatory was stable barn complex um, the carriage barn, if you will, which later became the carriage house. And um, the configuration changed a little bit, but this early conception shows the massing, the Barton house, the sister's house, lower right. Uh, Martin was absolutely passionate about plants, as was his wife, Isabel. This is him at an, in the neighborhood, but not at the Martin house site. This is another house they own looking at a European beech tree, throughout his diary entries, throughout his correspondence with Wright, one thing that came across very strongly was, hey, Mr. Wright, 
I want this garden developed as part of this planning process. It, 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 it's throughout his correspondence. We saw that and many other things that indicated this family's passion for landscape. This plan was one of the first that really drove home um, the integration of landscape with the building forms. So here we're seeing the first floor plans updated a little bit, uh, but again, showing the basic things I discussed previously. But what you're seeing here is the building forms are now even more so being surrounded by and integrated with landscape. And probably the most prominent feature is in the lower right uh, portion of the building. That's the veranda of the Martin House surrounded by what they called the hemicycle. So, uh, you know, half circle form garden space, the borders, the borders to the left of the screen all starting to become defined. The, the Barton House landscape penciled in at the top right of the screen. So definitely uh, very much part of the thinking early on. This is the most uh, developed planting plan, a 1905 plan of the landscape worked on by Mark, by uh, Wright, but also worked on heavily, we know, uh, with Walter Burley Griffin involved with a lot of this landscape work, his associate, and um, went on to become a very prominent landscape arc and architect on his, in his own right. So, uh, but this 1905 plan starts to focus in on plant species. Uh, the hemicycle, lower right, is heavily developed at this point and the borders flanking the pergola structure, uh, the thinking there, plant selections, all kind of beginning to come together. This plan actually guided most of the planting that happened, the landscape development that happened on the property. This is a detail of that hemicycle, that half circle form that was related strongly to the Martin House veranda. Uh, enveloped it um, and axially related to it. And uh, you can see uh, noted here various botanical names um, within this hemicycle form. This is the hemicycle uh, in 1905. Uh, it was right after it was planted. Uh, it became um, the right, oh, sorry, the Martin family. You know, wasn't absolutely thrilled with the outcome of this as it developed, but uh, there were some drainage issues the following spring and so on. But this is what it looked like when it was first planted. This is a, another view of the Martin House from the summit in Jewett Corner, right same period, right after the beginnings of planting and uh, that early work on the landscape. Another view, same period, uh, we're looking south toward the Martin House veranda. The hemicycle is uh, to the left of the veranda, and uh, the summit lawn is what's between the Barton House and kind of between here and the, the veranda. So I mentioned that the hemicycle was not well received by the Martins and I, part of it due to some drainage issues uh, below the hemicycle, between the hemicycle and the veranda. Uh, some of it may have been aesthetic concerns or lack of, um, you know, a well-developed enough geometry. We're not 100% sure what the, the dislike was, but the Martins began conversations with Wright and uh, his associates almost immediately after it was planted. And uh, the concept of a flora cycle, uh, we saw in correspondence from Wright as in late 2000, or sorry, 1905. And that uh, concept of the flora cycle was different than the hemicycle. The flora cycle was a very, very geometric uh, uh, layout of plants that had a rigid kind of repetition of uh, repeating patterns of bloom. There were 11 units. They were wedge-shaped to go around the semicircular form. Uh, 
the units uh, had two half units on the end. And um, so it was a very uh, much a designed piece to give a sequence of bloom. And also very important to note is that the Martins at this time, recognizing increased movement of cars uh, and you know people and the, the neighborhood was developing, they wanted more privacy. So the, the floor cycle was designed to give a bloom sequence, but also designed to give privacy. There was shrub layers to the outside, perennial borders to the inside. So this is a detail that plan, you can see to the far right, the hundreds of plants, perennials and so on that went in here. Um, and uh, moving on, this is a view of the flora cycle very shortly after that. So you can see how quickly the perennials are starting to develop. A couple of years later, you, you're beginning to see the landscape emerge from you know, sort of the stick forms that we saw in the early photographs. This is a view again from the intersection. One of the things you're gonna see here is that the elm trees, the American elms are really taking off in the neighborhood. You're also going to see the outer rings of the flora cycle beginning to provide a bit of privacy. As part of our work uh, in the cultural landscape report we did, uh, we put together uh, period plans and um, this is the 1909 period plan. And this plan shows to a great degree what the landscape looked like as it was fully planted out. There's only one element that wasn't uh, achieved at this point, and that was a little border planting that was up along Summit Drive that uh, was an area that was left open initially, but Miss, or Mrs. Martin Isabel quickly wanted more privacy and there was conversations with rights of right about walls. Ultimately, what happened was uh, Walter Bur Burley Griffin was asked by the Martins to develop a planted border to close that gap. He did this in 1910. Uh, he was no longer in the employ of Wright at the time. Wright was aware of what was being done and continue to correspond with the markets about all of this. But this provided the last bit of the planting. This is the last planting plan of consequence that we know about. Uh, later, uh, 1915, you're seeing that flora cycle border from the street intersection again. You can see the degree which is develop developing and evolving and the level of privacy and screening that's happening from the intersection. Uh, the planting uh, in, at this period was really beginning to take off. Uh, again, there was, there was kind of this concept of letting nature do its thing. And a lot of the shrub borders took on that kind of effect. A lot of the more refined borders were up near the buildings proper, but the landscape emerging. This is the East Terrace Summit, what we call the Summit Terrace. And again, you can see the perennial borders um, really beginning to fill in. You can see the wisteria vines along the um, building starting to take off as well. This is the flora cycle, um, again, later 1923. Um, amazing density along the road, some of the iris, some of the plants in the foreground. Many of the perennials ultimately were overrun by some of the shrubs, so that's what you're seeing here. Um, another image of the property, same vintage. This is after a wedding on the property. Uh, but again, look out at the veranda for the Martin House in the distance. Look at the shrub borders, look at the elms. Really a heavily, heavily planted and uh, growing landscape. Uh, some of the detail and some of the borders. Um, this is from the opposite side of the house. This is looking back at the house from just off the main property at what is known as the kitchen courtyard. Again, some of the native plants, some of the shrub borders, heavily, heavily developed and growing. Um, this is 1927. Um, this is 
1930. This is what they call the kitchen courtyard, which is on the west side of the pergola. That's the conservatory. Uh, and still, so this I'm sorry, the carriage house in the distance. Um, this is the what we call the, the kitchen courtyard. They had a peony, a double peony bed, um, flanking uh, walkways and a lawn panel, uh, perennial border to the right, which flanks the pergola. But this was the point at which uh, the, the, the landscape had emerged. You can see the wisteria a little out of control um, up near the carriage house. And uh, the beginning of actually the decline at this point in time, um, you know, in the uh, early 30s, Darwin Martin had a couple of strokes. He eventually passed at about 1935. Mrs. Martin, Isabel, hang, hung on to the property until 1937 when she could no longer keep up with the taxes. And the house was abandoned in 37. And this was the beginning of the decline of the landscape and the house. Um, and 39, you can see the vine cover in the beginning to consume the building. Um, a little later shot, this is the Barton House in 40. Um, things are really, really beginning to be let go. Um, and later, uh, you know, a decade or two later, you've got uh, things really, really deteriorated in a significant way. Um, indigenous trees are kind of finding their way into the site. It, the house is beginning to disintegrate. Um, and uh, this is kind of what the condition was in the late 50s, early 60s. There was uh, a series of uh, ownership transitions uh, through this deterioration period uh, after it, I should say, and um, pretty derelict at this point and um, kind of what happened. We, um, this is, Fast forward, um, the much of the you know much of the building structure was lost and reconstructed. The Barton House was not, uh, but at this point in time, the Martin House was not. But uh, there was rebuilding of pergola and other structures on the property. When we came into the picture in 2014, basically the landscape was a blank slate, and um, so this is what we were asked by the Martin House Restoration Corporation to take and come up with a re rehabilitation plan to bring, bring that back. So our work began with a heavy research phase, cultural landscape report, uh, and um, we developed a, you know, after doing all the research, we developed a treatment plan for rehabilitation. And uh, we went through a full series of design phases this is our uh, revisioning of the floor, the floor cycle in its glory in our design development rendering of what it should be. And um, so we went through this whole process, including uh, developing a plan uh, by which we would do the rehabilitation, which included uh, examining the various components of the landscape, what we call landscape units, and we started, uh, this is the overall plan we created of the rehabilitated landscape, but we, we broke it down as we studied it into the Jewett frontage, the floor cycle and corner intersection, uh, what we call the summit lawn, the summit terrace, the Barton house and the paddock, and the court, uh, courtyard, kitchen courtyard in Port Cochere. Uh, the gardener's cottage, which I didn't mention, but Wright also designed a gardener's cottage for the Martins on a separate parcel that fronted on Woodward Avenue. And there was a greenhouse uh, adjacent to that, further to the right, that was not a Wright building, but something that was a working greenhouse for the family. Um, and then we also did restoration of the interior planting in the conservatory and off-site, outside the historic core uh, was the 122 Summit parcel, a cafe and parking area that we did planning for. Our work, uh, this is a very tedious process that began with 
uh, our work on looking at the historic planting plans, coming up with ways to interpret those if best we could, replicating, but doing so in a way that would be manageable for the next decades to come. Um, and so this is early sketches. This is bringing back, using the planting plans, using tons of historic photos, and then sketching out and doing preliminary drawings of how to put this back together. These preliminary sketches, which there were many, and uh, hour upon hour of kind of figuring this all out, and then um, getting to a point where we brought them into CAD and created final planting plans, final construction drawings for the entire property. Um, these are our details, uh, construction details of the trellises that flank the pergolas. Uh, we recreated these and figured out how to do these in a really great way. Um, and even to the level of detailing out uh, historic nursery benches within the, the, the greenhouse, not the right design greenhouse, but the greenhouse that was part of part of the active uh, greenhouse that the, the, the Martins had on the site next to the gardener's cottage. So that level of detail went to um, the actual implementation phase after bringing on board a landscape contractor. But what we did, because of the complexity of the uh, floor cycle, this is the floor cycle, we actually gridded off the floor cycle, flagged the thousands of plants that involves that went into this and set out these grids so that we could accurately create the patterns of bloom and the sequence of bloom that were intended to go as part of the flora cycle. So that's what this image is doing. Uh, another view of that happening. Um, this is another portion where we, we laid out all the planting or installation by the landscape contractor, but we did all of this with great care because it, the compositions were so important, we, we handled this ourselves, um, and then they were all planted. So this is over by the uh, conservatory. Uh, Pergolo is just off to the left of the screen, and the wall connecting conservatory to Barton houses is there uh, straight ahead. So um, later that same year, we came back and Mark, I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I think we, we need to wrap up because we want to save a little time for questions. All right, I just need okay, three minutes, I'll be done. Um, so this is, this is the bulb planting layout. You can see this is the finished landscape a year later. This is the west side of the pergola. Um, this is the east side of the pergola. We're looking across to the Barton House from the Summit Terrace. Uh, main entry to the Martin House. Uh, this is looking down under the Port Cochere. This is looking at from the pergola out to the East Lawn, the Summit Terrace at the Barton House. A uh, beautiful shot of the west side of the pergola, the perennial border. Um, again, a shot of the entry. This is the capturing the whole east side landscape. There was a sculpture temporary sculpture installation in this image, and then uh, detail shot, and then back here to the kitchen courtyard. And just to wrap up, just speaking to the fact that we've once again kind of created the visual and spatial relationships that were uh, so important to this composition and the fact that you can now see once again an integrated architecture and landscape very deliberately and scripted by Wright and Griffin together with the Martin family. Um, so a very much designed landscape um, through in a very important um, prairie period designed landscape. So with that, I'll conclude. Thanks so much, Mark. And thanks to all of our uh, presenters. The the images alone are so amazing, both the contemporary images and the historical images. So thanks, thanks very much for that. We have a, a few minutes left for questions. So I'll go ahead and try to um, uh, start quickly on those. Um, we had two questions about falling water, in, in particular, the water at falling water. <laughs> um, 
how did Wright plan for the ways the stream might change the topography over time? And also somebody uh, was curious about the water system at Falling Water. Does Bear Run provide water to the house? What about gray, gray water or wastewater? Is, is that something that Frank Lloyd Wright considered as part of the design? Sure. <clears throat> I think the, you know, the ebb and flow of the, the stream is part of the experience of the house. So that was always intentional. Um, so after a, a spring snow melt, you know, the, the stream is, is raging, which, you know, amplifies the experience. Whereas in the summer, the stream is rather low and the falls can just be a trickle, which, which totally alters how you understand the house. And then in the wintertime, when the falls can actually freeze solid, the sound disappears from the landscape. And yet again, it's a totally different experience. But, you know, I think Wright and the Kaufmans both understood the potential damage the stream could cause to the house and it has uh, in the past um, wiped out the steps down to the stream um, lost sculptures uh, down into the ravine by high water um, so early on um, the Kaufmans were aware of the need to preserve the watershed so they started acquiring land along the watershed of Bear Run um, accumulating around 1,100 acres. And then the Western Pennsylvania Conservancy since ownership in the 60s uh, has acquired 5,000 acres. The main goal of that to protect the entire watershed of the stream, largely to control the, the flow of water um, through the landscape um, and to ensure a, a healthy ecosystem for the stream. So that was all understood uh, in the planning of the house. And then in terms of water usage, um, the, the guest house pool and plunge pools at the house are all spring fed. Um, the original water for the house was spring fed. Wastewater was stored um, and then pumped. So sewage would have been pumped out of holding tanks. Um, all of that's since been changed and now the entire site and all of the ancillary buildings are hooked up to a series of pump stations that feed into a zero discharge wastewater treatment facility that's within our reserve. So all of our wastewater gets recycled uh, to reusable um, gray water for, for flush uh, water across the site. So that's how we're currently managing it. Okay, thank you. Um, a couple of questions about Taliesin. Um, Stuart, um, are you able to dredge out the pond to make it deeper than it is currently? And also, did Wright leave any instructions or guidance about not cleaning the stone walls so they could sort of go back to nature? Sure, uh, interesting questions. Um, we are not planning at the current moment to dredge out the pond. That's as much a function of uh, financial resources available for the work as it is um, a set of other questions relating to increasing the hydrostatic pressure on the dam and some structural analysis that we'd have to do in order to, to actually look at, at deepening the, uh, the ponds. We are about, however, to do a, a burn on the prairie. And if you follow our Facebook, I hope you'll, you'll be able to see what we're doing as we burn the prairie, uh, the prairie that has reclaimed the pond land. Um, so um, both that will also be able to do soil analysis and see what we need to do to keep that pond ecosystem as healthy as possible. As for the uh, the stonework, um, we were having this discussion last week. We recently cleared away a lot of the landscape. This is something we did while we were closed for a year. A lot of the landscape that had overgrown some of the buildings, and now we can see the condition of the buildings a bit more clearly. I'm hoping some of what I saw last week was, was cosmetic rather than structural in nature. Um, but um, but one of the things we all agreed is that this was intended to function as a part of the natural landscape. And so Talias was never intended to be this polished and pristine building. It was intended to age. It was intended to, um, to become a part of the landscape um, and the ecosystem that was present there in southwestern Wisconsin. And so we do very careful management. Um, we look at structural problems and make sure we resolve structural problems. A little moss on the buildings, a little greenery, a little mold and mildew that will appear on the stone from time to time, as long as it doesn't create a structural problem is inherent to the character of the place. So we really respect it and, uh, and try not to uh, do anything that would destroy it. Great. Another question, um, and I'm not sure whether this is the case, but to what extent 
<clears throat> did Frank Lloyd Wright recommend landscape architects to his clients or seek to veto certain landscape architects? I don't know who would want to tackle that one. And I, I guess maybe that relates to the Martin House where uh, early Griffin worked after. Mark, do you want to take a shot at that? Um, I, all I can just speak to is um, I, I think at the Martin House, uh, Walter Burley Griffin was employed by Wright early on in the process, very, very active in the design of the site and produced a lot of the planting design. Um, I'm sure in consultation with Wright, I think um, there was discussion earlier that Wright had a strong association um, with other landscape architects, including Jens Jensen, and I think uh, was definitely interested in uh, the whole conversation about the Prairie School and uh, as it related to landscape mm -hmm. architecture. So I think definitely affiliation. I don't know to what degree um, landscape architects were recommended by Wright. I do know on one of our other Wright rehabilitation projects, I, I do not think the landscape architect was recommended per se by Wright. Stylistically, it didn't look that way. Um, but I think it um, I think it happened, but how often I don't know. Jennifer, did anything come up in your in your research um, on the landscapes? Yeah, I mean, I think kind of to Mark's point, what happened at the kind of turn of the 20th century is that Wright's milieu just included these, it was a fairly new profession at the time, um, these landscape architects like Walter Burley Griffin and Jens Jensen, but they were interconnected by a larger group of people like Avery and Queen Coonley, for example, were in the seed business. And so when the Coonleys built their house and they also built a kindergarten on the property, Jens Jensen did the landscaping. So in his archive, there's like plans for that. Um, so I think in the early years, there was just this mixture of architects and landscapes and gardeners and clients who were interested. Um, but from my, from my research, that kind of falls away after he goes to Europe. I don't really know of him like recommending at least consistently, mm -hmm. you know, or even using, you know, he's kind of using them at this time, but not so much later. So I think it's just a kind of like a happy confluence of, of events and people and things like that. I think we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you all for excellent presentations and I'll turn it back to Brent Glass. Thank you, Stephen. Thanks also Jennifer Stewart. Justin and Mark for a wonderful program. We can never get too much, or we can never get enough of Frank Lloyd Wright. I also want to thank Darwin and Neil for her generous support for this program and for the National Building Museum. And also to thank our production team, Paul Kilmer, Victoria Gonzalez, Braulio Agnesi for their great, great work behind the scenes. Uh, this program has been recorded and will be on our website in a week or so. So if you missed parts of it or if you want to see more of it, uh, you'll have that opportunity or tell your friends to, uh, to watch for it. And also watch our, our website, nbm.org, for future programs. Uh, we have a lot more in store for you in the next several weeks. <laughs>